Okay, so now we are at the uh, the quintessential American novel, Huckleberry Finn, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, um, who was one of the people that actually named the Gilded Age. So an era of American uh, history is actually named by this man. He was an anti-imperialist. Um, he was a satirist. He was a humorist. They say actually he's like one of the first comedians because he would go around doing all these talks. And um, and his book, Huckleberry Finn, is, is incredible. It's an incredible book. And uh, it's amazing how actually there's very few Huckleberry Finns around here. I remember actually the uh, Travis Simpson, the mayor of Warsaw, Kentucky, talked about how it was, he said it was a Tom Sawyer type of town. You know, Warsaw is just a Tom Sawyer type of town. And it is a river town. So, you know, to expect that there's going to be some rambunctiousness um, around to brag about it. People now say it's more Mayberry, right? It's Mayberry. We want to go to Mayberry. But, um, Versus of Huckleberry Finn, um, I, I feel like most people maybe haven't read the book or actually understood what was going on in it. Uh, Mark Twain said about school and education, how schooling interferes with his education. So education is about like how you learn and uh, you know just learn about skills and how you learn about life. And um, and school blocks that actual education from happening. Uh, Albert Einstein said a very similar thing also. So. Mark, or, um, Mark, uh, 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 Huck Finn was actually marked by the town and, uh, the Christian ladies who were taking care of him, yet they were really making his life miserable. So Huck Finn had an aversion to these, uh, the lady, the widow Douglas, for trying to civilize him. They ain't gonna civilize me, which is fascinating, biting cam commentary about the American scene. Uh, so he considered religion for a fleeting moment, but he never gave no more thought about it. Uh, so Huckleberry Finn, I'm going to actually just read some passages from this book, okay? So, this is, uh, the widow Douglas, she took me in for her son allowed she would have civilize me. And it was rough living in the house all the time considering how dismal, regular, and decent the widow was in all her ways. And so when I couldn't stand it no longer, I lit out. Right, he ran away. I got into my old rags and my sugar hog's head again and was free and satisfied. But Tom Sawyer, he hunted me up. He said he was going to start a band of robbers and I might join if I would go back to the widow and be respectable. So I went back. So here is Huckleberry Finn, right, running away from the uh, the Christian ladies who wants to so-called civilize him. And um, But uh, Tom Sawyer eventually gets him to come back because he wanted to start a band of robbers. So the widow Douglas, she cried over me and called me a poor lost lamb. She called me a lot of other names too, well, but she never meant no harm by it. She put me in them new clothes again, and I wouldn't do nothing but sweat and sweat and feel all cramped up. Well, then the old thing commenced again. The widow rung a bell for supper, and you had to come on time. When you got to the table, you couldn't go right to eating, but you had to wait for the widow to tuck her head down and grumble a little over the victuals, though there weren't really any. Thing, uh, though there weren't really anything the matter with them, that is, nothing only, everything was cooked by itself. In a barrel of odds and ends, it was different. Things get mixed up, and the juice kind of swaps around, and the things go better. After supper, she got out her book and learned me about Moses and the bull rushers, and I was in a sweat to find out all about him, but by and by, she let it out that Moses had been a dead uh, had been dead a considerable long time ago. So then I didn't care no more about him because I don't take no stock in dead people. Pretty soon I wanted to smoke and I asked the widow to let me, but she wouldn't. She said it was a mean practice and it wasn't clean and I must not do it anymore. That is just the way with some people. They get down on a, th on a thing when they don't know nothing about it. Here she was a bothering about Moses which was no kin to her and no use to anybody being gone, you see, yet finding the power of fault with me for doing a thing that had some good in it. And she also took snuff, too. Of course, that was all right because she'd done it herself. So, you know, hypocrite. Her sister, Miss Watson, a tolerable slim old maid with goggles on, had just come to live with her and took a new set at me now with a spelling book. She worked me middling hard for about an hour, and then the widow made her ease up. I couldn't stand stood it I couldn't stood it any longer and then for an hour it was deadly dull and I was fidgety Miss Watson would say don't put your feet up there Huckleberry and don't scrunch up like that Huckleberry set up straight and pretty soon she would say don't gap and stretch like that Huckleberry why don't you try to behave then she told me all that uh, all about that bad place hell and then I said that I wished I was there oh she got real mad then and I didn't mean no harm 
All I wanted was to go somewhere. <laughs> All I wanted was a change. I weren't particular. She said it was wicked to say what I said. She uh, said she wouldn't say it for the whole world. She was going to live so as to go to the good place. Well, I couldn't see no advantage in going to where she was going, so I made up my mind I wouldn't try for it. But I never said so because it would only make more trouble and it wouldn't do me no good. <laughs> right? So that's Huckleberry Finn, right? It's, just, it's in a, a boy's mind. And he's sort of a troublemaker, you know, a little rambunctious, but he's being um, forced to learn on all this stupid shit by all these uh, older Christian ladies, and he don't like it. So, I mean, he talks about religion, right? Um, first, he's talking about he doesn't like the obedience and the so-called, you know, do this and do that. So he doesn't really like that. And then when she told him about hell, she, he says, oh, I'd rather go to hell. And then she got mad. And uh, he was like, oh, I didn't mean any harm. I just wanted to go somewhere, you know. I just got tired of staying here, and I wanted to go somewhere. So it didn't really mean any particular place. Um, just I wanted to go somewhere, so fuck it. Let's go to hell, right? And, um... So he and he also says that uh, she said that it was wicked to say something like that, and that she was going to fight as hard as she can so she get get up to heaven. But he didn't really want to go where she was going. You know, he wanted to go his own direction, so he didn't really want to go to heaven, right? Their her definition of heaven. Um, so now she had got a start. And she went on and told me all about the good place. She said all a body would have to do there was to go around all day long with a harp and sing forever and ever. So I didn't think much of it, but I never said so. I asked her if she reckoned Tom Sawyer would go there, and she said not by a considerable sight. And I was glad about that because I wanted him and me to be together. <laughs> So, so she's talking about how great heaven is, right? All the angels, and uh, um, they remind me of that uh, that prostitute that killed all those people. The um, oh, what was that uh, movie um, in Florida? But she was like, oh, I'm going to go with all the angels, and I'm going to be with the harps, and they're all floating around and stuff. And then <laughs> she asked if Tom Sawyer's going to be going to heaven, and then she was like, absolutely not. And he was like, oh, thank God. You know, I, I want Tom Sawyer, you know, I want to go be there with Tom Sawyer. So if, if I'm going to hell, then Tom Sawyer's going to be to hell, be a better place, because, you know, I'm with my friends, and I'm not going where wherever the hell this crazy old bat is going. So... Well, I got a good going over in the morning from old Miss Watson on the account of my clothes, but the widow, she didn't scold, but only cleaned off the grease and clay and looked so sorry that I thought I would behave a while if I could. Then Miss Watson, she took me in the closet and prayed, but nothing came of it. She told me to pray every day, and whatever I asked for, I would get it. But it weren't so. I tried it once I got a fish line, but no hooks. It weren't any good to me without hooks. I tried for the hooks three or four times, but somehow I couldn't make it work. By and by, one day I asked Miss Watson to try for me, but she said I was a fool. She never told me why, and I couldn't make it out no way. I sat down one time back in the woods and had a long think about it. I said to myself, if a body can get anything they pray for, why don't Dinkin win? When get back the money he lost on his pork? Why can't the widow get back her silver snuff box that was stole? Why can't Miss Watson fat up? No, says I to myself, there ain't nothing in it. I went and told the widow about it, and she said that the thing a body could get by praying for it was spiritual gifts. Well, that was too many for me, but she told me what she meant. I must help other people and do everything I could for other people and look out for them all the time and never think about myself. This was including Miss Watson as I took it. I went out in the woods and I turned it over in my mind a long time, but I couldn't see no advantage about it except for the other people. So at last I reckoned I wouldn't worry about it anymore, but just let it go. So... He's finding out that religion is bullshit. He didn't care if he goes to heaven or hell. So but he's atheist, right? So in the very beginning, in the, the quintessential American novel, you have this rambunctious young man, Huckleberry Finn, who's just like, fuck it, you know? I don't want to go where you're, where you want to go, where these old ladies that are harping on me to do this and do that. Um, I'd rather be with my friends. Uh, he didn't see nothing about Moses. He didn't take no stock in dead people, right? And then also uh, he sees that praying didn't get him the hooks that he wanted and she's like, oh, you're stupid for saying that. It's like, well, what are you praying for, you know? Um, why would you do something like that? Huckleberry Finn, there's a lot more to Huckleberry Finn. There's the, um, the kind of shows a feudist, which in Kentucky is very big, the feudist out in eastern Kentucky. There's probably still feuds going on today or that had carried over from, um, you know, yesteryear. A lot of the feuds lasted for about 100 years, and people wouldn't even actually know why that had started. Like, basically, it happened for such a long time that it was just like, oh, we're just natural enemies. It's just the way of the world. 
uh, uh, there's other things that's going on, but this is the, the chapter one. This You'll find this within the very first paragraphs of Huckleberry Finn. And it just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks, really. I just want to kind of keep on reading over uh, more and more about it. So... Then actually, I'm, I'm thinking of some other um, books that I like. The um, that I liked as a young person, or that I had read as a young person. That was um, uh, the uh, book about um, the dog, the Call of the Wild, by Jack London. And Jack London is actually like a huge socialist, right? So. Uh, the Call of the Wild is just about sort of, you know, this dog that's being, uh, it's a sled dog, but he just wants to be free, right? Buck just wants to be, I think it's Buck, he wants to be free. So, it's Huckleberry Finn, a little bit about Huckleberry Finn. And, um, and yeah, there's also slavery, and it's also a heartwarming story about how Huckleberry Finn doesn't go with the social mores of the society that he lives in, and even though he's told that the Jim, the uh, the 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 black male slave, the older black male slave who ran away, um, he's on his raft and he's sitting there thinking, well, to be good, I'm supposed to tell him so he has to go back, but it's his friend, and he was like, well, damn it, I'm not going to turn on my friend. He's a good man, and I'm not going to turn him in. So he, um, you know, eventually he has a moral fight or moral conundrum in his mind, and they were going to freedom. They were going to Cairo, uh, Cairo, uh, so they could get their freedom. But actually, when they was on the re raft, that's when they were free. You know, when they were actually, you know, working together and had a, this good, uh, this nice little relationship between each other. Uh, it was actually sort of the only father figure that Huckleberry Finn had. And um, and he cared. Jim actually cared about Huck. So, you know, it's a good relationship between the two. And we get to watch all this unfold. And then he also he goes and has all these different adventures. I'm not sure how they actually say, oh, yeah, he gets captured. And then he has to rescue him later on. A lot of people say that Huckleberry Finn, the first half of it is great. And then the second half actually kind of goes downhill. Because Tom Sawyer comes back on the scene and he wants to make a game of, of rescuing um, Jim, but that could have actually be something bigger about, you know, the American psyche. So, whereas you could just get freedom, well, let's make a game of him getting freedom, right? Well, Lincoln said Emancipation Proclamation, well, let's end Reconstruction and pass all the black codes and the slave codes and let's, you know, have de facto slavery and have the nadir era of race relations, of which Julie Chancellor of... Um, uh, 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 Valley High traditional, not traditional school, but Valley High School would have no clue about. She don't know shit. She is so stupid. Okay, so next book, number five, Ender's Game. Okay, so the structure of the book is that there's a central command center for the military that has put a monitor on the little boy Ender Wigan and any other children who seems promising to lead the military. And first they had it on Peter, his older brother, then on Valentine, his sister, but they had somehow failed whatever it is that these commanders were looking for, and then he's a third, right? And being a third um, means that you're sort of a pariah in the society because you're only allowed to have two kids. And if you're a third, then that means, you know, you broke the law. And since most people don't have thirds, then they, um, you know, somebody being different from anybody else, they kind of get picked on. And he does get bullied, um, you know, later on in this book. And I'm going to read the, the thing first. But at first got to say something about Orson Scott Card, right? He's... He's basically a fucking psycho. He's lost his mind. Um, but hold on. So, uh, while the command center, there's an alien invasion that's happening. So they're trying to find the next best, you know, person to lead the commander fleet. And they're putting all these kids through all these different tests in order to see who is going to be the best and the brightest to lead this uh, this this uh, military. Um, um, operation against the buggers. The buggers is the alien invasion. And actually all of humanity is is together on this because we got an alien invasion that's invading us and so we all got to band together in order to save all of humanity. So 
they're observing Ender's actions, and he's being bullied by his older brother Peter. Only Valentine is the only person who actually loves Ender, that actually truly cares about his existence and being on the planet. There's some discussion actually about it because Peter is such an asshole and such a bully and such a jerk. Ender doesn't want to become like him, and so he becomes a foil for him to operate against that he doesn't want to be like. So, in a way, even though Peter is evil, it makes Ender good because Ender doesn't want to be like Peter. And Valentine, she's supposed to be good because she loves him, but when it comes to keeping Ender uh, one to fight for all of humanity, they, the commanders trick him and they invite Valentine to speak to him because he knows he's, you know, either she loves him or he loves her, and they use that love against him, so that way he continues to fight on when he becomes demoralized about the whole operation.